Uh, my name is Cynthia Coupe, and I am presenting on neurodiversity in the workplace, hidden differences, how to be inclusive when you don't know. Um, so I kind of want to get, have it be more of a conversation than me just talking at you. So I'm curious how many of you are familiar with the term neurodiversity or neurodivergent? All right, all of you are kind of, some of you more than others, great. So neurodiversity is really the term that describes all, everybody's brain, right? Each brain is diverse. It's like a thumbprint. Everybody has their own unique thumbprint. We all have our own unique brain. The term neurodivergent uh, refers to things like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, anxiety, uh, tick disorders. There's a, there's a bunch of different things that can fall under the term neurodivergent. It's not a, um, there's no classic definition for it. It's just a term that was coined in 1998 by a woman named Judy Singer who does a lot of autism work. Um, but it's come to most classically mean these different neurodivergent conditions. Um, it is about 30 to 40% of the population is, is guesstimated to be neurodivergent. Uh, we don't really know because it's a hidden difference and a lot of people aren't identified. A lot of us don't know that we're neurodivergent. Um, how many of you in the audience know somebody who is neurodivergent? Yeah. Um, how many of you, how many of you are managers? Are any of you guys managers? Okay, great. Do you have people in your workplace that you know are neurodivergent? That you think are? <laughs> like probably? <laughs> that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty common. We'll go into that some too. So there was a research uh, poll done in England, in London, and they and it was actually specifically for their tech force, and they found that 40% of people didn't want to share that they were neurodivergent, which, um, like, it's like surprising and not surprising at the same time. I think. Um, why don't people want to share? Well, it's hidden. I think there's a lot of stigma still that we're breaking past. Um, a lot of us don't know. I, um, I'm not. I have a learning disability, so I fall under the term neurodivergent because of that. But I didn't really think that I had autism or ADHD until my daughter got diagnosed at 10 years old. And um, I went through that process and I was like, no wonder I missed it. She's just like I am. So, but she has some stronger presentations, so they were more obvious. Also, it's later in, you know, diagnostic time, so people, so, so it's just become more popular to, um, be able to diagnose people. So a lot of times people might have gotten to be, how old was I when that happened? 45. I had no idea. I, I mean, I've, I'm a speech language pathologist. I've done this work for 20 plus years. I've worked with people that were autistic for 30 plus years and I missed it because what we're taught that means what we are, you know, what we think it means is something different than it, than it actually does. So that's, kind of my platform is like, let's break that down and have a real conversation about what that means, what that means to be that person and what that means to have people in the workplace like that too. Um, so, so what I kind of wanted to just to get, if you guys are willing to do this with me, what do you think could be some negative effects for a person that is neurodivergent in the workplace if there aren't accommodations for them? It's okay if you don't know too, but I'll, I'll wait a little bit. There's definitely like differences in comfort around different types of communications. Yes. Yeah. A lot of communication problems, right? Like um, a lot of times people that are neurodivergent communicate differently, whether that means that we take things really literally, we don't want to make eye contact, we talk rapidly, maybe our thoughts aren't linear, we're kind of all over the place. Uh, we misunderstand things. Maybe we ask questions inappropriately. I mean, there's a lot, you know, inappropriately. Like, um, there's a lot of social cues that that we might miss. Yeah, communication is definitely one of them. I'll go through the list I have. Um, unemployment. 
people that are neurodivergent are highly, highly unemployed and underemployed. So sometimes they have a job, but it doesn't really fit uh, their true abilities. So, you know, I know a lot of people, they're younger, but, you know, they um, work at the grocery store because they can get a job there. But they're, they have far more skills than that. It's just the grocery stores have figured out how to, like, support somebody that has autism. Um, uh, the percentage of people that are unemployed, I think, that are autistic is, it's like up to 85% which is staggering. But also, if you think about autism, there's a very big spectrum, right? So there are some people that are nonverbal, they don't talk, they, you know, they, they look like what we might classically think somebody that's autistic looks like. And then there are people like me, who don't seem like we're autistic, but it all falls under the same diagnosis. Um, so, so when I think of 85%, I think it's probably mostly the people that have autism that would need a lot of supports. In, in the workforce. Um, depression, not surprising, right? If we're uh, not being seen for our abilities, we're not really having a job or a life that we would like to be living, that can cause depression. It doesn't mean that people that are autistic or neurodivergent are more likely to have depression. It's just that the lifestyle is more likely, you know, what, what happens as a result can lead to depression. Um, I think it's 30% of people that are neurodivergent tend to be there are three times more depression in people that are neurodivergent. Suicide, of course, is also higher. Um, again, unemployment, depression, suicide. Burnout. This happens a lot in the workplace. Uh, we, we get a job, we're really good at it, so we're given a lot of extra work. And also, uh, sometimes our jobs fall into our special areas of interest, and so we do them until we burn out. Uh, we're seen in less as in the workforce. So maybe we're not included in things because it looks like we don't understand or we don't care. Um, and, and this is not just workplace too, this is communi community in general, uh, friendships even. Um, our communication styles, like you were saying, they're different. So that can lead to some, some negative effects. Um, we don't have friend groups as easily. We're not promoted in jobs. We're not given raises. There's quiet quitting. And then othering, that's when it's like, oh, well, I'm not this way, but you are. So that, that can happen a lot too. Like, oh, I understand that for you, but not for me. So, so when we aren't supported in an environment, these are all things that can happen. So that seems super tragic, right? <laughs> like, oh God, this is hopeless. So what do we do about that? Well, luckily there's a lot of research that's coming out. There's a lot of changes that are being made about what helps. It's all very new though. It's like, I think the... The groups that have been formed that are looking at this are only about four or five years old. So it's still in, a, in its infancy stages. There's a lot of really great stuff that's being done to help people that are neurodivergent, that are, that are obviously neurodivergent anyway, um, have jobs. There's partnerships that are happening. There's a bunch of organizations where you can like say, hey, I'm a tech company or I'm a, you know, whatever kind of company I am, I'm looking for employees and then they will, you know, they work with people who are neurodivergent and they'll match, they'll match jobs and then they'll offer support through, all the way through. Um, so some things that we're also seeing that work in jobs are work buddies. So setting up cohorts, so you have like somebody who has been working there a while or maybe they're neurotypical um, and you partner them with somebody who's neurodivergent or has, has special um, needs or accommodations. Active recruitment, looking at how we're actively getting people into the workforce. Um, Lean-in circles are another thing that's being done. That's like groups that are getting together um, and talking. And then trained coaches. So coaches like myself that would come in and talk with the managers um, or the organization and, and get more information. So really, I mean, So I, I talk about this a lot, and I, what, is, what we can't do is really create a system. There's no way to say, hey, here's the five things that you need to do to, to support your neurodivergent employees. We know that there are some things that we can do. We know that we, we change hiring practices. That's where a lot of people are missed, because when we're hiring, the way that a typical job interview or even a typical job application are, don't support the needs of somebody who's neurodivergent. 
Is anybody familiar with, with that, like changing hiring practices or that hiring practices are difficult for people that are neurodivergent? What can you, what, speak to that if you can. So I was thinking more in terms of trying to change hiring practices. Mm -hmm. Sure. Open source is a very challenging environment for someone who is white cisgender, frankly, mm -hmm. um, white cisgender male. And one of the challenges that we have at work at Red Hat is that uh, when we see someone come in, we value open source experience. But if the open source community is not welcoming to you and you feel like you are getting shoved out, mm -hmm. then that's not on your resume. And then mm -hmm. when you come to us, all things being equal, mm -hmm. Right. Oh. Sure. So, just for the video. So, at my company, um, we value open source. We value um, people who have open source experience, especially in engineering. And because if you look at like the Linux Foundation uh, stats mm -hmm. on this, um, and it's not just with uh, folks who are neurodivergent, but especially for really anyone who's not white cisgender male. Uh, you find that people don't feel welcome and they get pushed out. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a challenge then in the hiring practices where when you go, someone goes through the engineering interviews and we look at the resumes, all things being equal to the nature of where I work, that the person with the open source experience gets the edge. Mm -hmm. And it's a real challenge to try and adjust that so that we can be more welcoming mm -hmm. of someone who either was in open source mm -hmm. and felt pushed out or someone who didn't even feel welcomed in in the first place. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So changing what we're looking for and changing how we're, you know, how we accept that too, right? Yeah, that's, that's a big deal for sure. Um. After you have applicants, which is always a struggle is to, mm -hmm. find, to find good applicants, um, I'd, I'd be curious to know if you have thoughts on how to handle the, you know, the interviewing and selection process mm -hmm. in a way that you know, isn't unintentionally excluding anybody. Mm -hmm. um, something that I try to do is, is uh, have uh, kind of mul multiple phases of the, mm -hmm. the interviewing process that are different in form. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's some email conversation, there's a quick phone call, there's maybe a, you know, a Zoom with a couple team members, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a written aspect to it so that if, if somebody, you know, if, if somebody kind of seems to fall flat on, on one of those things, mm -hmm. maybe the other area will reveal. Yeah you know, some, uh, some strengths. Yeah. Say. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's really good actually. So looking at different ways so that you can see what that person is like in different environments is really important. Something else that's also really important is, you know, a lot of times, um, interviews are questions towards a person that they don't know what those questions are. And that's typically really difficult for somebody who's neurodivergent. Um, I mean, depends on you know, a lot of things, but, but it's difficult because, one, you know, statistically, and, you know, I know this from my own experience too, like something that we're not always good at is selling ourselves, you know, talking ourselves up. Um, we don't see our strengths in the same way that somebody else does. Also, uh, taking things literally or having to answer questions on the spot can really like shut us down and be difficult. So changing that style where, where either you're giving the interview questions beforehand so the person knows what it is that they can expect or you're letting them know, you know, something about what the process is going to look like, because that can create a lot of anxiety too. Um, I mean, and also, you know, we take things very literally. I and our, <laughs> I had this interview not that long ago, actually. <laughs> like, luckily, I got hired for the job, but <laughs> I was interviewing with um, to to do a. Um, I was going to lead a panel. Um, for the mainframe industry and they interviewed me and I didn't realize that it was going to be an interview. They had told me it was just like a, a discuss, like we were just going to talk and they were going to like learn a little bit about me and, and it like very clearly turned into this interview. 
and they were asking me all these questions, and I was like, I really, like, they're s simple questions, you know, like, tell me about yourself, and I'm like, uh, you know, and then they're like, well, what do you know about the mainframe, and I, I like, I froze, and I was like, oh my god, I think the project that they're talking about, and I, you know, I don't have a tech background, I'm like, I think the project they're talking about is called the mainframe project, but are they asking me that, or are they asking me what a mainframe computer is, and like, do I know what a mainframe computer, like, I think it's the brains of the computer, like, and I, like, I'm like, thinking all these things, I'm just like, uh, well, my brother's in tech, he could tell me if I needed to know, and they're like, okay, <laughs> you know, like, and they're just like, oh god, that was so embarrassing, you know, <laughs> I told my daughter, and she's like, oh, mama, that wasn't good, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it really wasn't very good, you're right, <laughs> but, you know, luckily they saw past that, hired me anyway, had I known those questions beforehand, I could have asked clarifying questions, you know, like, like in response, oh, hey, you asked me about the mainframe, did you want this? What exactly did you mean? Or I would at least be prepared to, to answer it. I knew all the answers. I just froze in that moment. My head was going a million miles an hour, and like I just kind of shut down. So, um, you know, and I think also we're working, I mean, it, it can appear surprising. These, these, you know, places where we're like hit up against a wall is surprising for us, but it's also surprising for the people we're working with because they're like, but you were like just there, everything made sense, and now you're somewhere else. Like, what happened? So anyhow, um, so changing hiring practice, changing the way that we're hiring, changing the way that we're recruiting also is really important. Um, something else that some companies are doing, I was reading about recently, is during the hiring process, they, they kind of have the person like shadow the job for a week or for a certain period of time so that they can make sure not only are they a good fit for you, but you know, are we like, do we feel comfortable in that job environment too? Because it's just as important for us that we feel good as it is for you. So I think that's a, I think that's a brilliant strategy really. Um, then you might have, you know, time to, to see more information too. Um, something else, uh, yesterday I, I gave a presentation of, on um, the SDDI reboot, the employee working groups that I'm um, facilitating with those also, but somebody was talking about um, being able to interview people um, differently in the way that you can, yeah, give them the, the questions so that they can ask those ahead of time and also letting them ask you questions. You know, so there's, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of little things that can be done to change um, and, yeah, recruitment again too, like partnering with, with universities, partnering even with high schools, um, you know, letting more people come in and observe can be helpful too. Um, of course, accommodating employees is a really big one also. I don't know if you guys know of any accommodations that you offer employees or what that might mean, but if anybody does, feel free to share. Yeah. You'll need the mic again too, sorry. <laughs> Have you found for neurodivergent um, employees that mm -hmm. remote work uh, is a net benefit or are there any trade-offs um, to the employee's growth? Especially I'm thinking for someone who's new and starting out in their career. Sure. I, so I feel like what I've seen and what I've heard is that it is actually a benefit to be able to have that flexibility um, whether that means that you're choosing your schedule some or you're choosing the hours of day that you're working or you're choosing if you're coming into the office versus being online. Um, a lot of people who are, I mean, everybody, right? Like, it's kind of applies to all of us, but I feel like like when we're at our best, we're going to do our best. And so if we're able to sort of have some flexibility with that. You know, I don't think it's like, oh, hey, come in whenever you want, work whatever hours you want. But like, if there was something that felt like agency and choice with that, then then it does seem to be more productive for sure. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's one of the blessings too that we've kind of got to play around with during COVID is like, what works? I think we've all seen how some things work a lot better and some things don't, but um, being able to have choice between seems very helpful. Thank you. Yep. Any other employee accommodations you guys can think about? So some that are pretty classic um, are um, offering environments that have 
the ability to have reduced noise or reduced visual input or um, you know, a quiet space to work because a lot of times people who are neurodivergent get overwhelmed, overwhelmed by uh, sensory, so sights, sounds, sometimes smells, right? There are certain times that like offices are like, this is a scent-free zone, like don't wear any perfume um, because it is a real thing. It, it can bother people. So that's, that's like a very, those are some fairly typical employee accommodations. Um, well, I'll get into this in a minute. <laughs> Training managers, of course, is also really important because if you're managing people that are neurodivergent, whether or not you know that they are, I mean, you pretty much know that you're gonna have, I would say, at least 30% of your workforce is probably neurodivergent. I mean, whether or not they know it. And, and I honestly don't think that we need to know it. This is, the goal is to create an environment where people are comfortable being themselves, no matter who they are. We don't, we don't need to know. And people don't need to disclose that to us. It's helpful, of course, but, but again, it's the whole environment change. How, we're, we're asking to change an entire system. You know, we're really talking about changing an environment, which doesn't happen, you know, like I said earlier, like, I wish I could give you five rules, but I can't because we're dealing with people and everybody is different and every manager is different and every work environment is different. So while we know that changing hiring practices and accommodating employees and training managers and working on different communication strategies work, that's going to look different in every environment. So it really takes uh, finessing and facilitating and being open to change and then you know it's it's almost like a bottom-up approach right like listening to what what do your employees want how can you have those conversations how can you have those circles or the support networks feeling comfortable a lot of times it takes somebody who is vulnerable enough or you know uh, outspoken enough to say, hey, this is me, these are my needs, this is what that looks like for me. And I think by the time we're adults, a lot of us do know what our needs are, whether or not we're neurodivergent, like, we're like, well, I know that I work best in a quiet environment. <laughs> so um, uh, th that was, a, sorry, that was something I was going to go back to with the accommodating employees or even during the interview process, is like asking people, so what works best for you? Or, you know, I had a manager yesterday was talking with me about, um, how they had an employee that was performing fine and then work got really stressful and they kind of had a, a meltdown, like they just sort of shut down. And the manager was like, I didn't know what to do because I didn't know this would happen to them. And I didn't want to be inappropriate, but I wanted to know if I could help them or call somebody or, you know, and, and I do, I know a lot of other managers that I've worked with, they have employees who are neurodivergent and they come in with their support system and their support system and sometimes their family like sometimes mom is calling the manager every week and checking in on their kid which might seem really weird but that's what's worked for them so so finding information like that out can be helpful in the process also you know again obviously it's sensitive information people don't have to disclose but but being open to Hey, are there any like, special accommodations that you have? Or I have employees that, that this happens to them. That can be helpful too. Um, communication strategies, again, like I think knowing different ways to communicate, not taking things personally can be very important, right? Like you see somebody that's doing something different. Okay, they're not looking at you. Well, we might have judgments about that, but maybe we can ask why. Maybe we'll ask ourselves why. Well, why, why might that be? What can I do differently? Or are they answering the question anyway? Um, what we really want to do in our workspaces is to create a culture of communication where everybody feels free that they can communicate what they need. They're, it's inclusive and they're accepted. That's the goal. But again, it's going to look different in every place that we are based on... <laughs> all of the things, right, based on the people. I mean, we're talking about working with people. So there's no, there's no blanket approach except for to start being more inclusive, to change some of the hiring practices, to change the interviewing process, to build in, uh, you know, groups of people that would be, you know, allies or buddies with, with your workforce. Um, and then to create a culture where it feels comfortable being able to talk about yourself and ask for your needs too. 
So I think that we need to focus on ability, not disability. I think we're more the same than we are different, and that's the opportunity here, is to start talking about how we are the same or how our differences actually can unite us. Because we probably all can relate to being in an environment that felt overwhelming. What do we need to do with that? Maybe we can have some compassion or some understanding for the people that we're working with that have maybe more of a need in that area. Focusing on the why. Why is this happening? What can I do to support it? And then learning styles. I think learning styles is a big one too. Some people are visual learners. Some people are auditory learners. Some people are kinesthetic learners. I, uh, ha have any of you guys played the game Risk? Okay, it's like a lot of rules if you read through them. <laughs> so I was playing, I haven't played for a really long time and I was playing the other night and so I had to go over the rules and I was reading them and I was like, I can't even like, like I'm a visual learner, but like the rules just weren't making any sense. So then somebody's like, well, I'll read them. And I was like, ah, this really doesn't make any sense. Like, so then we started having to just play the game and I was like, oh, I get it now, you know, but, but if, if somebody wasn't um, sensitive in that way, right? Even in the work environment, like I just told Johnny what to do and like he couldn't figure it out, what's wrong? You know, or like I gave them the written directions, they weren't able to do it, what's wrong? Well, maybe they're a kinesthetic learner, maybe they need to be shown. So thinking about, you know, different ways that we can adjust so that people can understand what we're talking about. Um, any questions? I mean, there's, there's so much to say on this subject, I could go on forever, but. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the recruiting side of things, mm -hmm. um, is there uh, any advice or best practices on, on uh, you know, I don't know, in a, in a job posting, is there something you should say in there about, you know, right. <laughs> neurodivergent applicants in yeah. welcome to apply or something? Yeah, I yeah, know. absolutely. I mean, I think that that always feels um, welcoming, yeah. right? Like, I think that, like, in some ways, it's helpful to start talking about the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that by doing that, it allows people to not have to hide. Right? So if you're like, hey, we're, we're welcome neurodivergent applicants, like a neurodivergent applicant, I mean, if I read that, I'd be like, wow, that's so cool, you know? And then it would give me an opportunity to even ask you, so what does that mean to you? Like, how, do you have other, like, do you accommodate people like me? Or, you know, rather than like feeling like I have to hide it or being like, oh, by the way, I'm neurodivergent. Like, you know, it, it's like, it just like gives that, that, that freedom, right? I, I was thinking about your, your, earlier comment about, uh, you know, asking people if they need any accommodations, which um, seems obvious uh, uh, for, for an existing employee. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little, I'm, I'm not sure how you would do that in the context of interviewing an applicant, mm -hmm. because that, that also sounds like I'm, I'm fishing for potentially right. confidential, you know, whatever right. medical information or, um, yeah, I know th it that could be, that could be very, uh, I don't know. They could, Right. Very uncomfortable for somebody. Yeah. And yeah. Really absolutely. To ask. So I don't. I don't know how you. Yeah. Well, I mean, I. I don't have a perfect answer for this. I mean, I know that some. Some hiring. Uh, you know, like, like how you can check if you're. You know, are you male, female? What's your race or ethnicity? Like, you can also do that with. Um, with you know neurodiversity, right? Are you neurodivergent, or do you need accommodations, or are you know do you have a disability? Which is also kind of an awkward question because, like, I personally don't view it as a disability. It's a different ability. It's not a disability. Um, but that's a whole another. As, uh, as the hiring manager, I suppose you could just, as part of the uh, process, just say, you know, by the way, we do right. recognize and offer and blah blah blah. Yeah. So if you need something, let, exactly. Know. Exactly. You can kind of let, let it be known. I know it's, it's, it's one of these things that needs to like unravel. It's a, it's a big, it's a big topic. Right. And there's not, um, again, we don't know the, the right way to do it, but you know, a lot of it is just starting with, with creating an environment where it's comfortable enough to disclose. And sometimes that takes one employee that's like, Hey, I'm going to talk about myself. I'm going to be outspoken. I know a man who is in the um, mainframe industry, and that's, that's what he started doing. Like, he was 50-something before he got diagnosed with autism. And he's like, oh, 
interesting. And then, you know, being the person that he is, he started talking about it more, you know, with his manager and with another employee that he was very comfortable with. And as a result now, like his organization has lean in circles where they, you know, they meet regularly and, and, and it's interesting because the more that happens, you know, first there's like some people join and they're like, okay, well, we'll listen to what, what this means. And then it kind of catches on. And so now the, the culture of his job is changing a lot. He feels more comfortable there. He has more friends, you know, so sometimes it's just taking that initial risk of being open. You know, even even in that way of like, hey, we're open to this kind of thing. So, any other questions or yeah? Um, so I'm an open source project maintainer. Mm -hmm. um, one, I, I, what I would like to ask you is, is do you have any advice for uh, folks who are maintaining projects or trying to drive like? managing open source communities um, in terms of uh, having the door open for folks who are neurodivergent mm -hmm. when unlike a workplace where we only we are a lot of us are fully remote or mm -hmm. we're only interacting through github or other mm -hmm. source um, system or through zoom calls mm -hmm. um, and there's different companies they're the only thing that might control or guardrail our behavior is a code of conduct. Um, so is there any kind of advice that you might have for projects that want to be opening and have that door there so that people can come in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think again, like, I think because we're dealing with people, the best way to do that is to start with ourselves, you know? I mean, which doesn't mean we have to be like, uh, you know, it's like, So how do I, um, again, like calling the elephant in the room. So whether we're, we're, we're like, you know, I just learned recently that um, probably half of us are neurodivergent and I don't know exactly what that means, but like, I know that sometimes I prefer to have my camera off or I move around a lot when I'm in front of the camera. So if you guys can be patient with me or, or is there anything like, has this been difficult for any of you or can, you know, like, like trying to call it out in a comfortable way, I think is the, you know, it's not, it's not a perfect uh, blanket solution, but I think that whatever we can do to show that we're comfortable talking about that, whether or not that's like, Hey, I learned this new thing. Does this apply to any of you? Or can I make this better for any of you? Um, Sometimes, you know, and you might get answers that are, you might not get any answers, but at least we're trying and, you know, being uh, open about having those conversations, I think, is what, what is important, you know? Yeah. Um, do you need that? Is this on? Oh, it is on. Yeah. Um, kind of on that note, I feel like I, I've attempted to try to encourage more like anonymous surveys as a way to yes because to kind of kick off those conversations of just learning how people identify and areas that may or may or not be represented in the space and then take that to a conversation or a meetup. Um, but I, I've been facing some challenge doing that mm -hmm. by privacy concerns, doing it either right. eat both as a company or doing it as part of the community. Yeah. And I've faced pushback on both sides. Companies mm -hmm. don't want to collect that information because it's highly sensitive and right. personal. Yeah. And these aren't customers. So right. we, we don't have an agreement with them. We don't have a contract. We right. don't have, so there, there's a lot more guardrails on being able to do it as a company. So when I've tried to support it as part of a community, mm -hmm. I've also hit issues where <laughs> right. the, the code of conduct committee or the steering committee wasn't comfortable Mm -hmm. having those types of questions be put into their, their, their contributor survey. survey. Right. Um, so I, I feel like what, what, I, what I've struggled with is sometimes it can mm -hmm. be really hard to speak up in those settings. Yeah. If you don't know you're not the only one. Like I feel yeah. like that's a hard barrier. And so I've been trying to encourage these types yeah. of things to create more visibility, yeah. but then facing those challenges yeah. where nobody wants the liability of having that data. Right. I'm just kind of curious how you see yeah. folks approach that. Yeah. So, so some ways that I've seen people approach that is again, like, kind of gently starting some of those conversations. So, I mean, even uh, it was part of a, um, a mainframe project where they, they were having different like um, panel discussions, but it was like, 
I was leading a panel discussion on neurodiversity, and so they found, actually it was really interesting because their goal was to find people that were in the mainframe industry that were willing to talk about it, and I was interviewing them. But we only ended up with one person, one person that was willing to talk about it. Then we had, I mean, there are three people, but it was like, I was talking about it from my side. This man that works for the mainframe industry was talking about it from his side. And then there was the son of somebody <laughs> who used to work for the mainframe industry who talked, was talking. And then there was a woman who works for a company that like does job matching, you know, so she like finds people that are neurodivergent and then supports them in the workplace um, or that's what her company does. And so, um, so that was fascinating to me because it was too vulnerable, you know, it was too raw for people to come forward. But as a result of that conversation that people watched and came to, so many people were like, oh my gosh, I can talk about this for myself now. I see what that means, right? And so that, then that created like a bigger understanding and a bigger, um, you know, more conversations like that. And so I think that, um, you know, th that's also like how one of those lean-in circles had started initially was that, that to keep that conversation going, then they had these regular meetings. Um, and sometimes it's, I mean, this, this individual, he's like, well, I guess I'm the only outspoken one, but now there's other people in the industry that have started to step up and, and speak. So sometimes it's just literally having those conversations for people to listen to. And it doesn't seem like anybody's maybe listening or there's, you know, real buy-in. You don't really know what's happening, but it's, it's doing something. I mean, it's, it's a lot, there's so much stigma. There's so much stigma about it, right? Like being able to see ourselves that way or being able to, to say that we're like that because we don't wanna be seen as you know, lesser than or different. But on the same token, like it, it, it creates more, like it creates better inclusivity, you know? Like we're, we are happier people and our workforces are stronger when we're, you know, acknowledge it and have people that are neurodivergent in the workforce too. So, so sometimes it's just gentle things like that, you know, that are very unassuming and kind of informative um, that, can, that can start the conversation. Yeah. Um, any tips or recommendations on how to deal with colleagues or managers when they're being neurodiversity non-inclusive mm. like i think the example the, the risk example is perfect and applies to me if you just give the rule set mm -hmm. this is ridiculous nobody understands it right or some people don't but yeah. showing them how the game is played they yeah. click right away and the yeah. same has happened to me mm -hmm. and others mm -hmm. on the workplace mm -hmm. just give me the rule set nobody understands anything right. so how do i tell a colleague yeah stop doing this you're being you're being new diversity non-inclusive right right i i mean i guess First question is, do you know, uh, are there any um, like written in accommodations or, or do you know if, um, if HR is, has, you know, like is HR supposed to be neurodivergent friendly, I guess? <laughs> very good question. Very likely not. Uh -huh. I think it's a very new thing. Yes. Um, that I'm learning a lot here yeah. about how I'm on the diversity committee on my yeah. company. We talk a lot about belonging and inclusion mm -hmm. on all the other minorities, but right. not really neurodivergent. Yeah, which well, is ridiculous. right. And I mean, so I'm gonna take a little bird walk. I will answer your question, but like the thing that's so fascinating to me is that neurodiver neurodivergency is the one thing that's like across all people. <laughs> like it's, it's equal. It's not more in men, it's not more in women, it's not more in white people, it's not more in people of color. It's equal. I mean, the statistics might not show that because of the way that our testing has been done. It shows that it's mostly white males, but that's not actually true. So, so it's everywhere. It's equally everywhere. So like if we can figure out how to accommodate people that are neurodivergent, then we've got, like we're accommodating everybody. You know, it's, it's such a great thing. Um, wow, I could go on a long bird walk, but I won't, I'll come back. <laughs> um, so that's a difficult question to answer because a lot of it depends on the manager. Right? Like some managers naturally get it. Maybe they have kids that are neurodivergent. Maybe they have a partner that is. Maybe they are themselves or they're just naturally open to doing things differently. So if it is that type of manager, great. You know, then you could probably be like, hey, I've, I've noticed this thing. I, I always feel like for me when I'm approaching somebody that um, 
you know, like I basically have to tell them you're, you're doing this wrong. <laughs> I always come from me. Hey, you know, for, I noticed this thing for me. I, ha I noticed that I have such an easier time understanding it when it's shown to me. I'm wondering if you could do that more. I know that that's also true for Jacob. You know, I was telling him something. It was so weird the other day. I gave him the instructions. And I thought he didn't get it. And then he, he did it. I showed him and he got it. Like, I'm wondering if that, you know, sometimes that like where it's sort of like you're putting the heat on yourself in a way, sometimes that can can help somebody so they don't feel like you need to do this different, you know? <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's, so, I mean, this is such a new idea in so many ways for the industry. And it's, and it is, I feel like kind of unfair to expect that all managers are going to be able to get it right. It's like, not all teachers can teach all people, not all managers can manage all people. So I, I think that like it needs to be restructured completely, or at least have like, uh, you know, a neurodivergent manager support, like, that, like, helps, you know, um, anyhow. But that's usually how I approach that. Or if there's somebody else, you know, that, that maybe has a better in with the manager, that is, like, an ally for you in the workforce, or, you know, something like that. And, and, you know, then depending, like, on, again, you know, on what the manager's, like, learning style is or what their interest area is, sometimes people like to read. Sometimes it's sharing an article with them, you know, about, like, hey, here's an article for you or here's a TED Talk that I watched that was really interesting or, you know, here, like, some something that would help expand their idea of, of learning styles or, you know, information. It's the best I can offer. <laughs> You're welcome. There's a, can you? I'm concerned about bottlenecks. You know, like it's very much like what this gentleman was just saying. You know, why should this be left to a manager? You know, this is nuts. Right? Absolutely. Like, like, so like w this has to, I hate to use top down, but this, this has to be recognized as having value, like at the highest levels of the organization. Uh, we'll talk about hierarchy another time, but um, and, and then people need to kind of have the resources that they need to be able to tap into this as and when necessary. Yeah. Right. So it's just like, oh yeah, we've got this issue. I don't have any experience with this. Where do I go for right. some help with this? There yes. may or may not be somebody who's experienced as yourself on the team, as opposed to just be like mumble, mumble. I guess we can't deal with it. Shove it under the carpet. Uh, right. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. So uh, there is a project that I'm. Uh, I mean, hopefully it's going to go the direction we want to, but. I mean, I say this because it's a volunteer run at this point, right? So when things are all volunteer run, like people run out of time and then the project never gets done. So um, it's the SDDI reboot for um, employee working groups. So we have one that's neurodiver neurodivergent, then we have one that's um, talent pipeline, and then we have one that's, um, that's uh, DEIA, so diversity, in equity, inclusion, and action. And so what we're trying to do is for the tech industry, find what the best practices are, like everywhere, not just for tech, but like that then can be employed. What's working, what's not working, um, and how can we become a resource hub? Like, can we get information online? So if, if you know, a manager's like, whoa, hey, or an employee even, right? Like, I, I need help on this information and then, you know, have like an online resource directory for that. So that's what we want to do. Right now we're at the very beginning stages um, and we've basically, we're starting a, um, a questionnaire so we can find out more about our practices that are, that are going on. We have like statistics on who it is that's in the workforce um, and we know kind of some things that are being done, but we're looking into, you know, industry standards and then also just, you know, what's working and what's not working for different employees. So hopefully we'll have that in like a year. <laughs> yeah, what, what I meant more, what, I mean, that's all, that sounds very promising. Um, and thank you for working on that. Um, I'm thinking like more of an incident incident response gotcha. situation like this mm -hmm. stuff is hitting the fan now yes. people are being affected now we all know the impact of this yeah um so how does triage occur in a way that it's not like i'm not all warm and fuzzy not interested you know as opposed right. to like this is actually affecting one of our greatest contributors yeah we need to shore up some resources and make sure this person feels supported even in an interim state just saying yeah this is absolutely an issue of significance. We are going to allocate resources to this. You will not be pushed aside. Yeah. You know, like there's even that interim state where you go out and hunt down these resources. Right. But you recognize that this is in fact an issue that is not to be pushed aside. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I wish that I did because, again, it, it, it takes buy-in, right? So it's either going to come bottom up because the employees are like, 
I have to be heard or it can come top down. I mean, it should eventually be top down anyway, right? It should be, like you said, the, <laughs> this is important. These are affecting our employees, but it doesn't always start that way. I mean, and you know, so in term, there are resources out there, but it has to have, you know, awareness of the managers and HR and where to go and what kind of information and how to support, but they need to understand that it really matters. So it's, but, but I would wonder, like, what has your experience been with regards to kind of regular training? Like, some people wince when they think about that. Oh, we have to go to this mandatory diversity training. Well. Right. Um, versus, like, no, no, here's, like, why yeah. this actually matters. Like, whether or not you can right. articulate that to your target audience is not the issue. The issue is, like, right. this matters to us as a company, as a culture. Yeah. You're, if you're here, this should matter to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think it's important. I think it's a good place to start, right? I, I don't think there's one prescribed way to do it, but I do think that then at least somebody's had exposure to it. It's gonna capture some people, it's not gonna capture everybody, right? But it is important to have that awareness out there. And I think, you know, our systems are so big that that we want big things to be able to change those systems too, right? But so like like a, a training is like a big system. Here's a here's a thing for a lot of people to take this course or whatever. Good good start. But then the fine the fine of it is gonna take, you know, more individual focus. Yeah, I think what you're alluding to um, is uh, literally from the get-go, like in the hiring process, there yes. need to be probes put out to truly identify whether or not people are aligned with regards to these particular values. And I have not seen that personally. Yeah. Like, you know, they, they might start slinging some words here and there, but, but there's not actually an intent to uncover right. the level of buy-in to that kind of ideology. Yeah. 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 I agree. And on that note, we have to let the next people get set up. Thank you guys so much.